Okay, I guess we are live. Uh, we're trying a different mic setup, so let me know if you can or can't hear me well, like if it's, you know, good, bad, and different. Uh, well, so far nobody's said doing his comments. Oh, okay. so. Say a couple things and I'll test you on this mic. Okay, yeah. Oh yeah. You're testing one, two, three, you're one, two, three. Loud and clear. Perfect. I, I love there this puck. This Jabra is like the best thing yeah, ever. It's fantastic. It's the first mic that attaches to all this stuff that I don't have to put in headphones. And I, I hate being like even like little earbuds and stuff, like are super distracting. Mm. Um, but yeah, anyway, so this just, you know, let me know how the technology is. This is a learning curve. I do have a number of different things back from podcasting days and other stuff. And like, we're kind of trying nice. different things. People are saying audio is better than last night. Everyone can hear you great. Good. Hooray. Good. I, I, I've been hoping for that. <laughs> okay. So today is day two in the process of making Kapet or Kifi, um, Kifi, depending on your pronunciation. Uh, ancient Egyptian Temple Incense. Uh, I wanted to show you guys a couple of the books. Actually, that probably the, the, the most useful book for research on this. Uh, the only downside is this is out of print. It, it's pretty hard to get a hold of. It is called Sacred Luxuries. And it is Fragrance, Aromatherapy, and Cosmetics in Ancient Egypt by Lise Manish. Uh, and she did all of the research that I... Uh, being me double checked and uh, went back and, and tried as well. Uh, but she's got a whole section on this, this incense, on its history, uh, and gives you a chronological list of the surviving recipes, uh, including the different debates about like what ingredient is actually what. Uh, so it's it's a fantastic book. It's it's a little expensive, even, you know, out of print because it's full color. It's really, really pretty stuff. You get to learn a lot about ancient Egypt and their spice trade and their incense and resin trade. This is the chapter on Kifi. Nice. Yep. Uh, somewhere in here, I actually, it's, please pardon my penmanship, but these these characters are, are the characters for for Capet or or that incense. So this is the little notebook I kept while I was doing the whole thing. So uh, if anything gets turned into a book along the way, it's going to come ma mainly out of these notes. So without further ado, <laughs> uh, we made the base of the Kifi mash yesterday, and that is over here in my extraordinarily overpriced copper kettle. <laughs> To be fair, it's handmade, it's solid copper, and also it was not the most expensive thing uh, that I could purchase. Uh, I went with this one because it felt like it was made with heart. Um, read a lot about the, the family of coppersmiths in Italy, who I kind of, I hope are still okay, because Italy got hit pretty hard. Mm. Um, but they also had like alchemy tools. They had like alembics and things for distillery, all made out of copper, like just some super cool stuff kind of out of my price range at the time, especially after paying for this beast. <laughs> so what we have in here right now is uh, finely chopped raisins, uh, ground juniper berries, and ground pine nuts with one and a half cups of a sweet red wine. Uh, the one that I have been using is Sang de Gita, Blood of Judas. It is a sweet and effervescent wine. Um, was it sweet? You, I mean, yeah, I had, I had you sample yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. It was definitely sweeter for a red. Yeah. Port. I still felt red. Okay, and, and port might be a good... I can't drink alcohol, so that's a sort of weird thing. Anyway, we have it with my, my little raven topper because I'm going to need another cup and a half as we go along, but not yet. So the thing that you saw me fighting with in the second one were... Uh, they were rhizomes, dried dried roots of a plant known as cypress grass or nut sedge or sedge grass. Uh, they, they look kind of like hard dried little cocoons if, if you actually like look at the things themselves. So after fighting with my mokehete, 
hope I pronounced that right. I ground them up and then I used my little Cuisinart spice grinder to get them finer because there was just only so much I could do in the mocha headache, which has a lot of pitting in the bottom now. Mm. But this was last night and a lot of today, <laughs> actually. So technically this should have gone in yesterday. Um, there, by most of the reports with this incense, uh, if you are doing it the way that they did it traditionally in the temple, uh, you would add certain ingredients over time. And like each day, as you add more stuff to this mash, they would recite hymns and prayers. Like this was a sacred act uh, tied to reconstituting the, bo the, the body of the god Osiris, uh, who becomes the king, lo the lord of the underworld. Um, in the very complicated Egyptian Book of the Dead tradition, um, every mummy is Osiris, or at least they want to equate themselves with Osiris because even in death, he lives again. So we're gonna put our ground nut sedge in here. That took so long. That was like four hours of that life. That was just so much grinding. Pounding on the book. Well, and, and like there's no way to, like you can't just take the nut sedge rhizomes, the dried rhizomes, and stick them in that. It just breaks it. So you have to pound them down and break them um, and get them coarsely ground. And then you can do the rest of the work in the grinder. Uh, I will admit I have been poking around and looking at, you know, uh, a couple of people have suggested nutmeg grinders. Uh, to see if there's maybe something that's a little, a little bit easier because it is, it's some work, but at the same time, there's a, there's a lot of oomph that gets in, that, that gets put into it. Like I also find myself kind of, as much as after a while, like pounding on the same thing uh, in the, in the grinder here gets tedious. Like, like the mind wanders, it becomes a, a meditative experience. Uh, as long as my wrists hold up. All right, so what I'm doing here is just getting this mixed thoroughly in the moist. Uh, I've seen this referred to as kefi dough or kefi batter. Uh, it does start to kind of have a batter consistency to it. Like right now, it's just wet, goopy stuff. It smells. Uh, well, mostly like the bitterness and the sourness of the wine um, that's been left to stand overnight. Now, I don't know if there's any like formal fermentation process that is going on or is supposed to be going on as you let this stuff stand at room temperature over the period of five days. Uh, it makes some sense that there might be given like the, the, the must that would be on the raisins or the dried fruit. Uh, I do know that you want it to not get moldy. Like, that's the thing. Like, you have to throw the whole thing out and start again if it gets moldy. <laughs> so, yeah, keeping it at, at a temperature where it's not going to do that is, is tricky. Uh, I will say I didn't have a problem um, last time. And I realized uh, in retrospect that uh, I started making this last year around about the same time. Didn't even like, it just felt like the right time to start. Uh, Cause uh, what, what dates were House Kepru's gather last year? Uh, last year, the, I want to say it was the 12th or 14th of June. That sounds, that sounds about, maybe about then. Yeah. Somewhere around then. So I can make a new gym. <laughs> and I had, I had timed it. The, the creation in May that I'd had time for it to do the whole like the whole two weeks thing and then a little bit of curing. Uh, with this incense, the curing is the key like it. It's a sticky gooey melted Tootsie Roll mass until it cures uh, and it can take up to six months to cure properly, especially depending on how um, humid your particular location is. I think it cures faster in less humid areas, kind of makes sense. Uh, I'm gonna move this back over here because what we're doing today uh, is adding three new ingredients that will be ground together. In the recipe, you have, they separate them up 
uh, kind of by type, which maybe made it easier to, to translate a couple of them to sort of track down what they were. Today, it's going to be aspalathos, camel grass, and mint. Mint is pretty easy, and this is three tablespoons of each of these. Uh, aspalathos is one of the ones that there's some debate about what it is, uh, but it's one of the easier ones of, of the disputed ingredients to maybe go, hey, this, this makes sense that it's probably this, uh, because there is a plant that comes down to us that aspalathos is in its, its scientific uh, designation. And that is African red bush or rubos. We drink it as tea. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a related plant called honey bush. Uh, and I'm going with honey bush. I actually, I bought um, green rubos, red rubos, and honey bush. And I smoldered each of them to get a, a scent to like see what they smelled like if you were actually using them as incense instead of tea mm -hmm. um, over different levels of heat. And I had a bunch of other folks who like were, were eager to participate in this pro project to kind of like, I, I would put one on and be like, okay, everybody, what does this, mm -hmm. what does this inspire? Like, like, does this smell like it would belong in all of the descriptions we've read of this incense? And the one that had the, the notes that seemed the best was honey bush. Uh, in doing further research, honey bush is a little bit more regional to where they would have been harvesting this from. Um, African red bush is a little bit farther south than uh, makes good sense. Um, not to say that they didn't have very extensive trade networks, and that's also what makes it tricky. There are a couple of questions yeah. about storing kifi uh, and whether a dehydrator would be able to be used. I absolutely tried to cheat with a dehydrator to uh, speed up the curing process. I totally did. Um, it didn't work as well, and that kifi didn't have the same intensity of smell. Um, I mean, it was it was good. It was intense. Like, like, don't get me wrong. Like, this is a heavy resin incense. It's got a ton of stuff all packed into it. So even if you cheat and dehydrate it to get the curing process and cut it down a significant amount, when you smolder it, you still get a fair amount of the effect. And there are some there are some dinners, some dishes that are best prepared by hand and from scratch, mm -hmm. rather than using like the microwave. Mm -hmm. And I will say that the stuff, um, the logs that I'd made of the kefir to just sort of set aside to see like what happens if I just leave them, have a different smell. And everything I'd read had suggested that that was the case. That it's actually there's an aging process that goes on with this incense, which also makes me wonder, like, you know, there, there's no, like, bubbling right now, like, no obvious um, indication that there is fermentation, but, but it ages like a fine wine. It ages like mm -hmm. a fine cheese. So what sort of containers do you store it in once, you know, once the mash is all made but while it's aging? Um, glass. I also used, uh, so it's, it's incredibly sticky. Um, I have purchased a, uh, a paste, a, a marble pastry board, uh, because it acts so much like candy that when you, for, when you finish it and you need to roll it out, uh, moving it to a chilled marble pastry board, um, we'll get to experiment with that this time, um, seems like it will be the easiest way to work with it. The last time I used a lot of baking parchment that's a little bit nonstick. And so like I, I, I was rolling it around on um, my cutting boards and they were getting just covered with sticky resinous uh, kifi goo. Uh, and then I started, I tried wax paper and that didn't work at all. Like wax paper just stuck to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but baking parchment worked really well. And so a lot of the older batch, there's like these logs of it that I just rolled and I put um, and covered them up in the baking parchment and just set them aside somewhere um, in some of them. So I took some of them to Inspiration House, which is not as moist as the area around here. Like there's some swamp here and it tends to be damper um, just year round. So I took some to Inspiration House and I just put them in a drawer and let them cure there. Um, I experimented by freezing a couple. Uh, and I will say that those uh, didn't cure while freezing but can be brought out, worked mm. with because they're frozen, they're a little bit less sticky. There, there's, a, there's a point where you can work with it while it's still really cold and chilled, roll it into the little balls, and then set those aside. 
Um, and I have in the exercise room here a big platter um, that's just open air. It's not covered up or anything. It's, it's up high where the cats can't get at it. Um, and it's just, there's a layer of parchment paper and little keefy balls just sitting there, slowly getting harder and becoming cured and more intense. Uh, another thing, because it's incredibly sticky, is I started using, uh, and I found that several other people who make this do this, finely ground, like powdered um, benzoin, Styrax benzoin. Um, it's, it, it is an incense resin in its own right. It's definitely something that was used by the ancient Egyptians and a lot of their things. Um, some of the best stuff is from Ethiopia, which uh, if you know where Egypt is, Ethiopia was down here. Um, and a fine powder of benzoin lets you like roll the balls in that or like shake a bunch of the balls in, like almost shake and bake them. Hmm. Uh, and then you now right. have That's... things that you can you can handle without having yeah. it get super sticky. That's what you did with the pellets for the salmon live. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah, and benzoin has this warm sweet smell to it that mm -hmm. blends very well with, with with the kifi and there are later recipes that put benzoin directly into the kifi so it was one of the things that i'm like this is a good solution and it's not outside of the realm of possibility like it goes with the smell that the scent profile um i try to keep everything else either in like little bowls of glass um you know your your usual like stoneware uh, and I have a bunch of like little marble dishes and things that I picked up at probably World Market uh, because they were on sale and I'm a Capricorn rat. <laughs> we like sales. <laughs> Anyhow, so this, there's no clear indication. Um, the most extensive ingredient list is recorded on the walls of the temple at Edfu in what's known as the laboratory room. They did a whole bunch of making incense and medicines and stuff in there. And they were smart. They just stuck all the ingredients, all the recipes up on the walls. You weren't sure like what measurement to go, just like, oh, it's right there. So, <laughs> real smart. Um, the thing is, is like there's some instructions there and not as much as would be helpful to completely recreate like exactly all of the steps like the prayers aren't there um exactly like if it's if there was a time of day or a specific way that you were supp supposed to put this into the incense um that was probably so well known or part of training under other circumstances that it, that's not included in the recipe um i do want to note uh for aspalathos there there are I said it was disputed. There's several other people who have different interpretations for what it probably was. Um, Marathakis and I, I've got a bibliography here that I might share with people at some point. I intend to share with people at some point, just don't know if I'm gonna type it up today. Um, and they suggested that it was, pardon me, because this is the Latin genus and species name, uh, Calirotome velosa, su suggesting that the root is used. Uh, and this is a small shrubby tree uh, native to the Eastern Mediterranean known as spiny broom or as hairy thorny broom. Um, and it kind of gives me the, hey, honey bush makes sense because they're very similar plants. Like I looked, mm -hmm. I looked them up, I looked at like what they looked like. Um, and while they are not of the same genus and species, uh, descriptions, and that this person was basing it off of the description of what the plant looked like if you were just reading the description of the plant, where it grows and what its flowers look like, you'd be like, oh, spiny broom or honey bush. I'm gonna go with Aspalathos. Uh, the other two are pretty easy. Um, we are substituting lemongrass for camel grass uh, from all of the research and everybody else who's talking about this particular type of incense and how you make it and what its ingredients are. Uh, pretty much everybody agrees camel grass was a variety of lemongrass grass. <laughs> uh, and then the other one is mint, uh, which given the like warm, spicy, resiny flavor profile, I was like, uh, mint? Okay. Uh, now there's no indication spearmint, peppermint, chocolate mint, some variety of mint that existed back then. Mint, that's all we got. So 
I've made a point whenever possible to make sure that all the stuff here is organic. Um, and, and more than that, in most cases, wild harvested, uh, just because I didn't want to mess with any other, like, so I'm a tea drinker. And, and the thing about tea and pesticides or chemicals is if you have a refined enough palate, you, anything that this plant is exposed to, it translates into the tea. You may not taste it, but you are still getting it in your tea as well. So you're like soaking these leaves. So I didn't want to have weird modern chemicals or, or whatever get into this um, for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is I didn't want it to screw up the scent. So today's three things are all going to have to be three tablespoons. And those measurements are based off of um, what is known as Edfu 1. There are actually two recipes of Edfu, uh, and they have slightly different measurements. Um, I think mostly with regards to the frankincense uh, and probably just represent different uh, different priest styles of it. So this is going to use up all the rest of what I've got in here. As I sploosh it everywhere too. Technical term, splooshing. Yup. Oh, this <laughs> smells fantastic. This is the spearmint. Oh, well, that does smell. Yeah, no, it's a really strong. Um, I've got little um, oxygen ears in, in all of these to like keep stuff preserved as much as possible. Illyria was looking at me sideways when I was buying like all of these. <laughs> little did I know that you had so many ingredients that you actually needed all the jars. Yeah. It... And now we need more jars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this turned into a thing. <laughs> oh, open up. All right, honeybush, aspalathos. Three tablespoons of you too, and that looks. The other thing I liked about purchasing these is they came pre-ground. Oh, so sneaky. I'm still going to give them a little turn through the mocajete especially because the lemongrass I have is not cut at the same level. So here's our substitute for camel grass. Whew. Hello. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I made a mess. <laughs> These little things it's like, like the effective seal. Yes, they're fantastic. They, they suck up all the oxygen. Mm -hmm. Keep everything fresh for even longer. And this is the lemongrass. And there's going to be some grinding that must happen. Hmm. There's a question about whether you've ever tried Egyptian mint. Uh, I couldn't track any down in time for this since I have now used up the last of my little spearmint. Um, and this this spearmint um, I, I bought from Crete. So that little, yesterday I'd mentioned um, there's one ingredient that we'll be using tomorrow, I think, um, called uh, gum mastic. It's marketed these days as Chios gum because it only grows on the island of Chios. Or it can only be harvested there. The plants that it comes from gr grow lots of places. The environment that, that is required for these plants, these trees, to weep these um, mm. bits of resin only happens on this one island anymore. Um, so in having to make an order already to Batano, and get mm. Chios gum, I bought their spearmint on the theory that it is Mediterranean spearmint as opposed mm. to spearmint that is just picked up from my backyard. So I'm going to mix these up a little bit and you get to watch me grind. Not in the fun way. <laughs> I mean, it does have some pretty fun results. Yeah, well. <laughs> I mean, I do have a Cuisinart spice grinder over there. And if I get impatient, I can use that. 
but there's something to be said for standing over this and mixing these two. So I can smell the lemongrass and I can smell the spearmint and I can smell the sweeter honey notes of the honey bush as I am grinding these together. Uh, Manish, who wrote the Sacred Luxuries book, uh, goes on about the perfumer's art. Uh, and one of the things about perfume that I didn't know until I was reading her book is the order in which you add various ingredients has an impact on the overall scent at the end. And while the process for making this incense is different from the process of making perfume, uh, there does seem to be an impact of how the smell turns out based on what goes in when. Um, and the one thing that we know from ingredients that survive is frankincense goes in fairly late uh, and the myrrh is the very last scent to go in. Um, and there may have been um, religious reasons for that. Myrrh was used in mummification um, and it was associated with um, the art of embalming. Uh, myrrh cur currently is in many people's uh, toothpaste. Like it's still used commercially. It has antibacterial properties and I believe antifungal properties. Uh, it's got a very uh, medicine-y anise-like taste, uh, a little bitter, uh, and a very distinctive perfume to it, a very distinctive scent. And by having the myrrh be the scent that goes in last, when you first burn kifi, myrrh is usually the first smell that you get. You get the myrrh, you get the frankincense. The frankincense opens up to a lot of the piney, uh, resiny things that are in here. Gum mastic uh, is, is piney, and there is actual pine resin, the pine nuts, the juniper, all of those have piney smells to them. And then the stuff that we started with first, uh, the, the raisins and whatnot, start to give you like this, along with the honey that, that binds things together, starts to give you like this sweeter underlay. <laughs> this is the boring part. If you have any questions, please. There was a question, uh, not about a specific ingredient mm -hmm. and what could be substituted for it, but what would happen if someone was allergic to one of the ingredients? Are there ingredients you could substitute for some of them? Yeah, so I know somebody had mentioned that they're allergic to juniper, and, and I am a little bit too, uh, so, so I'll be perfectly honest about that. Uh, having gone through this whole process and like sort of smelled the results of all of the things that I think you could easily like dispense with, juniper would be the top of the list. Um, although if you're allergic to juniper, you may also have problems with a lot of the other pine stuff too. Uh, so the thing with this incense is like I, there are just from the ancient world alone, let me see if I've got it listed here. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've got a recipe at Edfu, actually two of them at Edfu, and those are probably the oldest. Uh, there is a recipe um, by, recorded by Manetho, a Greek writer. There is um, instructions in a recipe, um, and this is Plutarch referring to Manetho's recipe. Um, Plutarch who gives instructions as well as, you know, what all goes in what. Um, there is the Ebers papyrus from 1500 BCE, which has another recipe. And the thing is, is they, they have many diversions, fairly extensive diversions, things that they have in common all the way across the board. Frankincense is, appears in pretty much all of them. Gum mastic appears in pretty much all of them. Myrrh appears in pretty much all of them. Uh, and cypress grass and camel grass uh, are, are ones that pop up everywhere else as, as well. Um, so I would go at least with that's the base. And the raisins also, raisins, honey, wine, that's, that's in there. Um, and then the rest of them are, think of them as potential like variations. Certainly modern makers of this incense view it as such so that they will make a number of substitutions. 
uh, there's a later one that's like closer to the Greek and Roman world in terms of like when it was probably created that has spike nard in it. Um, and I bought some spike nard. I oh my God. do not enjoy that like at all. The closest thing it smells like to me is um, valerian root which smells like dirty gym socks, like sweetly molding dirty gym socks. Spikenard is one of those perfumes that is mentioned in the Bible, and it's supposed to be this fantastic thing, and it makes me want to retch. Um, now, you may have a completely different reaction to it because I'm a super taster, and I've noticed that let that genetic quirk means that I have a different experience of a number of these things. But uh, Spikenard was, was not my favorite. <laughs> Uh, other things that uh, are some substitutions uh, or additions, labdenum, um, which is this, labdenum has a neat fun story. It does have associations with Osiris, um, and it's harvested by goats. Labdenum is one of those things that I'm getting from that uh, little place called Batano in, in Crete, a little Greek thing. And so it's it's this like spiny like thing and they used to in the ancient world have like these specific combs because goats would go and eat it and then you would harvest the resin from their from the little goat beards and there were special combs for this like we still have these little like combs for getting the precious resin out of the goat spirits well when i got the stuff from batano because they were like this stuff is like old school no joke there's goat hair in it <laughs> authentic yeah as goat beards yeah as authentic as goat beards okay that's all right i'm gonna put the first bit of this in there i think my the lemongrass is really fibrous so it's the one thing that you can definitely still see in there Do the second half of it. Uh, one of the articles that I read with regards to labdenum, which is still widely used in um, a number of perfumes, like it, it's it's a fundamental part of the perfumer's art, uh, mainly for masculine scents, that warm musky scent that has a little bit of a spice to it. Uh, probably has labdenum in it, whatever it is. It is also a fixative, so it helps anchor the sense of other things. Uh, so it makes sense that it would go in here. Uh, I did not include labdenum in my first Kifi Bash because it doesn't appear in the Edfu recipe. I did pick some up, I played with it, I burnt it, tried it out. Um, I will say there's a mix that involves labdenum where you have uh, benzoin tears, little 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 uh, crystals of benzoin, and you melt the labdenum down, and you like you like warm this over low heat, and you basically like toss the benzoin in it so that the benzoin is lightly coated, and those two smells together is something I could just sit and stick my nose in forever. Like I love it, the sweet and the warm and the spice. Mm. It's the thing um, when I've been doing the uh, little rituals, um, the connection yeah. meditation. That you put on the burner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah when it's not kefi, it's uh, that mix of labdenum and benzoin. Mm. There's a question from Kathy. Uh, does the kefi dry out or does it remain soft with the oils that are in it? Uh, it can get pretty hard, but it warms up. And so, well, as it will soften if it warms up. Uh, so over time, it, it kind of, with the resins, it kind of takes the, if you've ever handled um, frankincense uh, or, or myrrh in their original thing, like they're like sort of like these big resiny crystals, it has a texture closer to that. But with the raisins and the honey, that sort of softens that up a bit and does turn it in. It's very candy-like. It, it's sort of like a, a chewy taffy. So if it gets cold, it's it can be rock hard, but if you warm it in your hand, you can work with it. 
Uh, and so like the, the little bricks that I, I've been sharing with people, because frankly, like I, I realized that sitting there and like rolling it into individual little things, like people have different needs for like how much they want. So I wanted to do the old fashioned way where like you take a pinch off yourself and roll it. Um, if those ever are so hard that you're not sure like that you can get a pinch off of it, just warm it in your hand, um, preferably with a little bit of like parchment paper so it doesn't stick to your hand when it warms up. Mm. And if you don't have a fancy bakur burner or other sort of burner for this, uh, honestly, just putting it in a pan on a little bit of tin foil on a hot plate uh, between about 150 degrees and 180 degrees is what I have found to be the optimal temperature. It'll it'll melt and it'll bubble a little bit around the edges. It won't um, it won't do like full heavy plumes of smoke. What that does is it just slowly releases the scent. Uh, you can put it on directly on charcoal and you will get a lot of smoke, but you need to get it off the charcoal pretty quickly because it carbonizes very swiftly. So you'll get like this quick flash, lots of smoke. It's pretty cool. And then it smells like burnt sugar. And that's if you put it directly on a charcoal. It's why every time like I, I pass it off to people, I, I have like these little, basically a little pamphlet of like, this is how you use this stuff. It is not what you're accustomed to. I can see why they sang hymns. <laughs> asking about types of burners again. Uh, there is a mermaid. I think I think they hadn't caught yeah. the, the uh, word okay. uh, bakur. Bakur. B-A-K-H-O-O-R. So um, in the Middle East, they still make incense closer to this stuff than like our little cones and, and sticks. Uh, they are these densely packed uh, little bricks of resin and precious wood. And they are not burnt directly on a charcoal. Uh, they make something specific for them called a bakur burner that helps release the, the, the scent without just like turning them into charcoal instantly. Uh, so there's a company called Atar Mist, A-T-T-A-R, M-I-S-T that has a variety of bakur burners that were fairly inexpensive. Like they had one that was $15. Um, the only downside with theirs is you they're, they're electric. You just plug them into the wall, uh, but you don't have a dial to control the temperature. There are some burners from Japan uh, that do have a dial so you can kind of choose from 100 degrees to I think 250 degrees where you where your sweet spot for how intense the heat is will be. And the only easy to acquire place uh, I found one of those was through uh, an incense making, um, it's a little indie store, uh, and I think it's called Mermaid, M-A-D-E. And I have this lovely little lotus burner from them. Now that one was not cheap, it was uh, $70 but it is well made, uh, has served me very, very well, is ideal for this stuff. They were kind enough to have sent it with a lot of free samples uh, of different things to burn on it. So, you know, if you have the spare cash and you really want to like go full on like luxury with this, that type of burner is the one that I would recommend. But, you know, as somebody who grew up poor, a hot plate and some tin foil will work just as well. The only reason that putting it on your stove might be a pain in the butt is that's not necessarily where you're going to be doing your meditation or your magic or any of the rest of your stuff. And like 
for me, the process of researching this and crafting it uh, as true to form as possible uh, was inspired by <coughs> goodness, an experiment I wanted to run for past lives, for past life recall. Um, we know through psychology, scent is one of the most potent triggers of memory. And by extension, I wanted to see if the scent of the, the authentic scent of this temple incense would be something useful for people who felt they had a strong tie back to ancient Egypt. There are a lot of people who feel that they have connections there. Um, and you know, my, my thing about that is the ancient Egyptian culture lasted for millennia, not a hundred years, not even a single thousand years, thousands of years. Uh, so the likelihood that you spent at least one lifetime there is pretty high. It's a little bit like China, like they've been around forever. So if you've got a lifetime over there, um, especially because it's a culture that like didn't change for long, long periods of time. And that's, that's something I was talking about in one of the other ones. Think about the United States. We are, what? We were founded in 1776. That's not really that long ago. Uh, and we've changed radically over the, the centuries that we have existed. There's a couple of like, you know, things that we still have in common right across the board, but we're, we don't look anything like we did in the 1700s. Europe, the European countries are a little older, but even there, there's a lot of change and a whole lot of change, especially that's happened in the past century, century and change, honestly. Um, but if we, we look back to these ancient cultures, it's not to say that the pace of progress was slower so much as they, they maintained their way of life with myths and iconography, the style of their architecture um, it, for, for lengths of time that are kind of unheard of to us. You know, here we are in the digital age where language and slang and fashion changes in days months years but but overnight in some cases so it's it moves at a pace that's just hard to hard to parse all right i'm going to bring this over here for you guys because i do a thing to get all the lessons it's in and if you're wondering where I got the mojete, it was uh, World Market. So today's ingredients in reconstituting the sacred body of Osiris in the form of the incense kifi, lemongrass, aspalathos, otherwise known as honey bush in this case, and spearmint from the island of Crete. And we mix all that into the wet stuff and make sure everything's wet. There will come a point where we put in another cup and a half of this red wine, but we're not quite to the point where we need it. And then this is going to get to sit. And, and the purpose of letting it sit with the wine and everything else is now there is a chemical reaction. It's also why this is in a copper pot. Uh, and so the, the, the resinoids and the flavonoids that are in these uh, different ingredients will open up and mix and spread amongst one another and change and deepen the scent. And each day adds a new layer. I 
feel like I'm a World Market uh, commercial. This <laughs> is also from World Market. Um, yeah, that's some neat stuff. Some overpriced stuff, too, but some neat stuff. Yeah. And that's what this looks like. Kind of like brownie batter, honestly, at this point. Just sort of mushy. Now that you've said brownie batter, it looks delicious. You don't eat it. <laughs> I mean, at this point, especially, it, is, it would not be tasty. soon don't eat this that's for sure <laughs> i mean it's not poisonous but but you will regret it <laughs> like just yeah, from I the mean, way i can smell it right now like it's just going to be sour well and for the amount of you know red wine in there i might as well just have a little glass of red wine yeah it's important <laughs> there will be some okay. of this wine left and i hate wasting it so feel free when i'm done oh, good to, know. to polish it off <laughs> We can raise a glass with everybody, and you can drink for me. Lovely. All right. Drink for two, as they say. Yeah. Okay. Well, and now we set it aside until tomorrow. Now I get to do my part of sending out all the orders for Kifi. Comes back in its corner. What is in here? Uh, last year I kept it mostly out in the garage, but we've got like a polar vortex coming in and just a bunch of stuff. So in here is the better place for it right now. Uh, bye. I hope it, it let let us give us feedback on like the sound and stuff too, because this is a new work in progress. Bye. Good night, everybody.